Hello and welcome. Well, in response to school closures caused by COVID-19, the increased use of technology has seen the biggest pedagogical change to education in generations. And despite the restrictions and challenges that teachers, students and parents have faced by not being um, allowed in, in classrooms, technology has really eased that burden in supporting children in their distant learning. So the question is, how will education be different when we get to the other side? You know, should we expect education to be the same? And what will we gain from this journey uh, for better quality education? Well, to discuss this today, we're really thrilled to be joined by 3P Learning uh, Global Head of Education, Alan Dugan. Now, 3P Learning are the, the global leaders in education technology. Um, and in Australia, they deliver a suite of learning resources for schools and families co uh, covering mathematics, spelling, literacy, and science. Now, 3P Learning creates and distributes uh, award winning products which you may have heard before, such as the flag, flagship Mathletics, um, Reading Writer and uh, Reading Eggs, which have been delivered to over 4.5 million students and over 17,000 schools globally for, for more than a decade. So this is um, going to be a really, really interesting and I'm really thrilled to have this conversation today. So thank you for joining us, Alan. How are you? My pleasure. I'm great. Thank you for having me today. <laughs> well, we know you're a very busy man at the moment, so we're very, very grateful for your time. Now, COVID-19 has really brought about, I guess, the greatest disruption to children's education in recent history. And it's really not been, I think, since World War II that countries have really seen, I guess, um, globally, um, I guess, a shutdown and a lockdown um, in education um, in the same time period and for the same reason. So I would love to know from your perspective, what do you think we have learnt, um, I guess, the most uh, during these last few weeks that we can really apply, um, I guess, in the future or to the future? Well, I think, I think we now <clears throat> live in a world where we have seen the evolution of flexibility, flexible working, um, flexible <clears throat> jobs and so on and so forth. And, and the world's got smaller in the last 10 or 15 years, you know, the, the the globe is much more accessible and I think what's happened in this period of time you know, during COVID-19 over the last 10 weeks or so is that we've learned in education yes it's been challenging yes it's been difficult but we've actually learned that we can be flexible in how we approach learning and teaching we've learned that learning can happen in different places and in different ways and I think we walk out of this or we, we start to emerge from this and we should be confident in our ability and capacity to do things differently. I think the other thing that's been really reinforced through this journey is something that, that we've known for a long time and we, we talk about, but I think it's really been reinforced. And that is that the schools and learning is about so much more than the curriculum. It's not just about your times tables. It's not just about your spelling words. It's about the social development of young people. And so I think as we come out of the other side of this, we, we have a deeper understanding of, of what it means to educate, but we also have a, a confidence that we can do things differently and be flexible. Yeah. In your personal opinion, do you think that, um, I guess this COVID-19 era will, well, I guess, re revolutionize how we approach education in the future at all? Look, I hope it does. I think that would be my first um, response to that question. I, I think it would be really sad if we think that getting through COVID-19 means that we go back to school. I think we absolutely want to get students back in classrooms. We absolutely want schools to resume. But I don't think that we necessarily want to go back to what we had before. There are things that we had before that we will be craving and looking forward to and we will absolutely harness those in classrooms and learnings across schools in the country and, and in the world. But there's also things that we've had to explore because of this remote learning and teaching journey that we wouldn't have had to explore under normal circumstances. Yes. Things like, as we see in the highest level flexible learning, remote teaching, but also relationships with parents, how we access parents, what we do with them, what technology opportunities are out there, what, what hardware technologies, but also what software technologies are out there that can really help us. And I think as teachers, we've been forced, um, if you like, and maybe forced is a strong word, but we've certainly had to think about what it is we're trying to teach. And so often I know in my own classroom over the years, I got into autopilot. I know what I'm doing. I know how to do it well. Yes. And I'm yep. going to do it. 
And, and I think actually what we were forced to do in this was, I may well have taught this thing for the last 10 years, but all of a sudden my, my students are at home, I've not got them in the classroom, I need to start thinking about how I deliver this to them and how I engage them with the learning. So I think we, we will um, change education. I hope that education is not the same at the other side of this. I hope we realise the importance of face-to-face -face teaching and the elements of that that are critical. But I also think we can harness the power of some of the remote things that we've learned and certainly some of the technology aspects that have, have developed and grown through this time. Mm, and what else do you think, I guess, should change? Is there anything else in addition to that at all? Look, I, I think that as I've been talking to people and we've been reflecting internally, I think we need to continue to look at what it means to have tools that support effective learning and teaching. So when I think about it from a, a, an ed tech perspective, if you like, resources that we provide, we need to think more about how to support different forms of teaching and learning. So, for example, you know, <laughs> three months ago, January 2020, if I had come on here and spoken to you about synchronous versus asynchronous remote learning and teaching, I can spell synchronous in January. <laughs> now I use it in every other sentence, right? And when you talk about, is this going to be a synchronous learning lesson? Is it going to be asynchronous? We hear our premiers and, and prime ministers, not just in Australia, but around the world, talk about returning to face-to-face -to -face teaching. These are words, almost buzzwords, that have come out that all of a sudden are changing how we approach and think about learning and teaching. So we need to think about what's the important parts of synchronous teaching, what's the important parts of asynchronous teaching. I think the other thing that, that is absolutely true in this is that we have a new, or parents have a new or a renewed appreciation of teacher. I'm a parent, I've got three young kids at home. My oldest is 12, my youngest is six. And I'm a teacher, my wife's a teacher. We've been in the industry for, you know, three years plus combined. And I know that teaching my own kids at home has been really challenging for us. And all of a sudden, I have a new or a renewed appreciation for the teachers that teach my kids. Absolutely. And we know we've done, we've done some surveys over the, last, over the last few weeks, right the way through this journey. And at 3P, we've been surveying teachers to really make sure that we understand what their challenges are and how we can best support them. And one of the things that we've consistently seen is an, uh, an improvement or an increase in the amount of parental engagement in students learning through this journey and we see a new engagement of parents in students learning and yes. I think we need to look at how we harness the power of that we need to Absolutely. look at how we actually keep parents involved in learning how we keep them at the center of it and that really excites me because I think for so long now in, in educational circles around the world we've been using this buzzword of parents as partners in the learning journey but what does that mean Yes. And COVID-19 has just forced us to look at that and go, what does it mean to partner with parents in learning? How do we make it richer? How do we do that? So I think that's something that, that will change. I think the other thing that will change or needs to change is, is assessment. We know from, from teachers that assessment is something that's top of mind um, in their heads. How do, how do we assess? What does it look like to assess? We see national assessment um, plans and schemes be, be postponed this year or delayed this year not happening and things like that plan here. We know that um, year 12 exams in other parts of the world in the UK, some areas of the US are, are not happening this year. So it raises a question about assessment. What is assessment? How do we do it? How do we do it well? Assessment is all about validating learning. It's all about proving learning. How do we do it? What does that look like in the 21st century information world mm. where information is everywhere? So I think there's some really exciting opportunities and I think we, we will do really well if we begin to address some of those opportunities that have come up. And those opportunities, like, let's be clear, those opportunities have been challenges for teachers and parents and students through this journey. They have been challenges, but as we come out of the other side of it, let's make them opportunities. Let's think about how we can enhance the learning experience for students because of mm. it. Well, I guess the notion of an educator um, as the knowledge holder who, I guess, who imparts wisdom to their pupils in largely sort of no longer a fit for purpose um, in the 21st century education, you know, students really are able to gain access to knowledge through, you know, a, a few clicks of their phones, tablets or computers. So I guess in saying this, you know, do you think that we will need to refine the role of the educator in the classroom at all or, or not? I actually think we've been doing that for a little bit of time now. I think the points that you make 
are points that were true, you know, three, four years ago as well. The whole idea, and, and I, I get on a hobby horse when I talk about this, but the whole idea of 30 years ago, teachers, as you said, they walked into a classroom, they were the carrier of knowledge, they imparted knowledge, the students went away and memorized that knowledge, they, they came back, they regurgitated it, and they passed and they moved on. And knowledge was king. And but all of a sudden today, as you see, knowledge is everywhere. I can pick up my phone, my tablet, a um, number of different ways to access information. And so it's not about information, it's about learning to learn. It's about how we prepare our young people for jobs in the future, yes. for careers. You know, we, we know the statistics, the, the number of, of um, students have gone and have multiple careers. It's not like 30 years ago where you left school, you, you trained for a trade or you went to university, you got one job and it was your career. We know that they will go on and have multiple careers. We know that the average student will go on and have do jobs that don't currently exist. So how do we prepare them for it? Well, it's not about giving them knowledge. It's about giving them the, the skills to learn. Yes. How do we help them learn to learn? And so I think this journey has, has reinforced that to us again, the importance of learning to learn, the importance of, of being motivated and learning to learn. So do I think teachers, teachers' roles are changing? Yeah, I do. I think that journey had began before this COVID-19 journey and I think what's actually happened or what I hope happened and I've been very optimistic in this is that teachers have been um, reassured that actually the change that needs to happen can continue to happen. We have the capacity, the ability, the technology in order to achieve it. So I think that they, we are on a journey and, and if we ever stop being on a journey in education then we need to stop. Mm. You know, well, I guess COVID-19 has really compelled everyone to evolve and, and adapt um, to facilitate remote learning and, and use technology to maintain that, you know, personal connections that would normally be sort of face to face mm. in a classroom. So I'd love to know, do you think that um, teachers and students have actually benefited from using technology in replace of face to face lessons or not? What are your thoughts on that? I think that's a great question. And look at that research that I was referring to earlier that we've been doing here at 3P uh, over the last 10 weeks, at the very start of this outbreak, um, one of the questions Lori asked teachers was around their confidence in using digital classroom tools. Mm -hmm. And 15, in fact, 16% of them said that they were not confident in using digital classroom tools. In our most recent survey last week, only 7% of them said that they lacked confidence. So they, we can see that journey already of mm. growing in confidence in the use of digital tools, digital learning and teaching tools in classrooms. We've shown in this journey that there is room for flexibility, that we can be flexible, that we can take our classrooms into a flexible dynamic and, and make it work. However, what I think we've also done is we've validated the important role of the teacher in education. Like I said, we've got parents who have this renewed appreciation for teachers and the job that they do, the newfound or the renewed appreciation for, for what happens in the classroom and what learning and teaching looks like. And so I think what we've really began to do is validate the importance of face-to-face -face teaching, yes. but also the role of technology, the role of how we harness the power of technology and remoteness and so on. So I think what we will see is a real um, transition to more to, towards a much more authentic, blended learning experience I think is, is the buzzword that we would use so teachers are absolutely critical that face-to-face -face is really important and we know as I've already said that the whole social aspect is one of the pain points of this this COVID-19 as adults we've been told to stay home we've been told to not go out limit our social interaction to those in our house and so on but we've done the same to our children who are used to going to school each day and playing with their classmates and learning how to be a good friend, learning how to engage with their peers, learning what it means to be part of a, a community and, and, and find their role as a good citizen. And all those things are gone at the moment. And until we back to school, there's a real challenge in how we, we fill that gap. So, so for me, the, the blended approach that how do we use technology to really empower, make learning and teaching better, but also equip teachers to do good face-to-face -to, -face to really develop young people in learning and teaching yeah you know i guess in the midst of this um the COVID 19 crisis a lot of us are thinking about the world that we're really leaving the next generation and you know we're wondering you know as you mentioned before what we actually need to prepare the students for the future um so you know i'm sure that you're familiar with the dell technologies report that stated that 85 percent of the jobs that will be run in 2030 that generation Z and Alpha will be entering haven't even been invented yet and, um, and a, a, 
according to the World Economic Forum report, that 65% of primary school children today will be working in jobs that don't exist yet. So, you know, and you've, you've sort of alluded to that with some of the stuff that you said earlier. So, you know, what can education technology platforms do in this instance to help prepare children for jobs of the future then? Look, I think the first thing is that point I made a little while ago about that whole, the importance of learning to learn. It needs to be about how do we help our young people to learn how they learn best. So the, the, the content, if you like, the, the times tables, the mathematics, the literacy, the science, the geography, they're all really important, but they're the vehicles by which we help our young people to actually learn and actually go through that journey. So we know that the, the, the how of learning is so much more important than the what of learning in this day and age because of the accessibility to, to information. So therefore, what we need to be doing is to develop higher order thinking skills. And we know that, the, the, you know, it's a buzzword, but developing higher order thinking skills is really important because it allows or it helps students to problem solve as they try and take it from the known to the un or the, the known to the unknown. It helps them to synthesize information to sense check it. Never before have we had so much information in front of us. Never before have we been faced with such information. We need to be able to sense check it. Is it right? Is it wrong? And so on. And in fact, last year at 3P, we spent a big part of the year wrestling through what what some of this means and we've added a whole host of what we refer to as problem solving and reasoning content to our mathletics product that whole idea of of rich um problem solving activities that's much more about student thinking rather than the answer at the end of course the answer is important but yes. how you get there is so 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 important so really that whole idea of how do we help students to think to make those connections in their brains those pathways and I think that we've got a real evolution of ed tech at the moment that really helps us to um, join the dots between learning to learn you know we've got artificial intelligence that can really help us we've got machine learning that can help join the dots and learn gaps in student learning and try and fill them but we've also got some real good understanding now about what parts of student well-being are really important and how effective strong student well-being leads to effective strong student learners and so really I think as we start to um, harness the power of ed tech it's all about um, making good learning connections and making good social well-being connections and putting them together and I think we've always we've always in education and probably in ed tech but always in education thought about them almost separately at points and I think what we're starting to see now is this this meshing, this combining of them. And I think that's really exciting. As an educator, I'm really excited about that. Mm. Now, 3P are glo global leaders in online education and you're currently in classrooms all around the world. Um, in your view, what can Australia actually learn from other countries? And do you have any key learnings or insights that have really worked overseas that we should look to apply here in Australia at all? Look, I, th I think what we are <laughs> what we are learning is it continues to be a journey. Learning is a journey, and I think for us in schools around the world, it's about how do we equip our young people to be that effective learner. And I feel like I'm I'm kind of riding the hobby horse a little bit hard here, but that whole idea of how do we help them learn to learn is that point. And I think the role of assessment is really critical in that journey. And, and when I say assessment, um, people often think about tests. When I say assessment, how do, how do, we, how do we test them? Um, and really, when I talk about assessment, that's probably the, the bottom of the list of things I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about things like, how do we help students to self-reflect? How do mm -hmm. we help students to evaluate their own learning? How do we help students to um, see what they've done and be able to evaluate it against maybe what they should have done or what someone else has done and then make some learnings from it? So that whole idea of feeding forward in their learning, using feedback to feed forward. So I think we're seeing some, some really good stuff around the world around the evolving role of assessment and how we assess students, how we equip them to do it. I think we're seeing some really um, strong things come out around how we help them problem solve, how we develop those higher order thinking skills, those soft skills, if you like. And I think we're seeing some really um, effective strategies starting to evolve around literacy as well. Not that they haven't been there before, but we're beginning to look at, it's about the needs of the, the learners today. And the needs of today's learners are different to the learners 10 years ago, 20 years ago, yes. because the challenges are different. So mm -hmm. really beginning to look at today's learner 
we're seeing lots of how do we develop today's learner, how do we develop these soft skills, how do we engage the parents in the development of these soft skills, what does, you know, what does the big question, I don't know if I even want to mention this word, it's like swearing, what does homework look like, how do we, how do we use homework, what does that mean in a post-COVID world, and we see some mm. very strong views around <laughs> that, but I think the whole idea of creating um, learners who learn, and I think it then pushes back into the purpose. What's the purpose of the learning? Mm. Why are we doing this learning? What does it do? Creating the need, if you like, for the learning. So I do think that there's some uh, there's some different places around the world that are doing different things. I think that I think encouragingly, one of the things that I love to see in my role is I see I get to see different classrooms in different parts of the world and how they're doing things. But it, for me, one of the things that excites me most is I see what they're trying to do is create learners who have autonomy in what they're doing learners who have purpose in what they're doing learners who are able to you know build relationships be socially connected and um, do all those things really well so for me there's there's a real um, excitement about what the next generation of, of education looks like Mm. And I know that 3P Learning, you've been working with tens of thousands of teachers um, across Australia and around the world, and you've got lots of insights into how schools and teachers have been impacted and reacted mm -hmm. um, to COVID-19 and the crisis. So is there anything um, from those insights that you can share with us at all? Yeah, look, I, th I, think, I think we know, you know some of those insights I've shared around things like assessment, uh, parental engagement, in engaging with digital tools. I think one of the other things that, that, that I've touched on and I'll maybe take a bit of time to expand on is just the importance of, of social connection. I've really heard from teachers across Australia and across the world that they're missing their kids, that they're missing the students in their classroom. And I think one of the things that has really, I've been really reminded of through this journey is that, um, that the importance of relationship in learning, the importance of social connectedness in learning, and the importance of, of what it means. And, and learning is a social endeavor. Therefore, yes. teaching is a social endeavor. And for me, I, I, I just want to you know, salute every single teacher out there who has championed their way through this crisis. And we're not at the end of it yet, right? We've still got a way to go, depending on which part of the world you're in and, and where you're at in terms of coming out of it. But, but for me, I've watched teachers grow. I want to develop my whole child. I want to, to develop the whole child in terms of who they are. And I think the academics is one part of that. And, and it's much easier to give resources to develop the academics in a remote setting. But how do you develop the, the, the student's social, emotional well-being of a student through this journey? So for me, I've watched teachers really do that well, really wrestle with how do I support the well-being? I've, I've told this story to everyone who's listened to it. I spoke to a, a year 12 teacher in Australia just, just not long after we went into the kind of lockdown. Mm -hmm. um, and she, she said, I've, I've got a year 12 homeroom class and, and I've had this homeroom class since they were in year 10. And it's just, it was a girls' homeroom class. They did single gender homeroom class. So she said, and it just kind of became the habit that on the girls' birthdays, I gave them a birthday card. <laughs> she said, and on the second day of lockdown, I kind of glanced down and I noticed that it was a girl in my class's birthday. She said, and I just felt this really deep-seated pain. She said, just this ache inside of me of what's this going to do, not just to this girl, but to them all. And she said, and so I didn't know what to do, so I just got the kid's number out of the admin office and I phoned and I wished her happy birthday. She oh. said, and I don't know if it was if it was better for her or for me, but it was just this <laughs> emotional connection, this really important. So, and, and that's what learning's about. Yes. Learning doesn't happen if the environment's not safe. Our teachers create really safe, nurturing, loving environments, whether that be in a kindy classroom or a year 12 classroom. And, and, and they still have been trying to do that through a remote distance um, mm -hmm. setting. And so I think, the importance of that unseen curriculum that we talk about, that those elements are, are really front of mind for teachers. They're aching to get their kids back in classrooms. They're missing them. And I think that has really excited me and re-energized me about education. Education is not this airy-fairy world of academia. It's really important, that's really important. But education is much more about that. Education has the power to break poverty, it has the power yes. to change lives, it has the power to, to break abuse and and violence and, and all of these things, the domestic, sorry, education is the key to unlocking so many things. And it is that because of that social element 
of that whole rounded student element. So I get excited about that, as you can see, I'm kind of rambling. <laughs> it's a good, it's a good thing. Now, I guess for a while now, educators um, around the world have been sort of talking about the need to rethink how we educate future generations. Um, and this might just be the disruption that the sector really needed to have us all think and uh, rethink about how we educate. So like, what are your thoughts, um, I guess, on this, this shake up? Yeah, and, and I think I think there's 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 more of an iterative process ongoing than a need to kind of revolutionise everything and throw it up in the air and kind of see how it lands. Because I think we see um, teachers on the journey to what does it look like to create learning and teaching. And, and as I said, I think mm. that what we have discovered is that um, actually we have more capacity than we thought to be flexible. We have more capacity than we thought to change things around. Yes. We have more capacity than we thought and so on. I think one of the questions that we, we are going to be faced with as we get students back into classrooms is what does student engagement look like yes. in, in a post-COVID world? When you've got students in the classroom who have been used to sitting behind a screen in many cases or in front of a workbook for several hours a day and then you come back into a classroom and you ask them to conform to the routines of school again. Yes. Now, for most students, routine is a really welcome safety. However, not for all. So how do we, what, do, what, does, what does the new normal look like? How do we engage our students? What does it mean to um, motivate them for their learning? You know, and, and that whole idea of, um, I think we've, as teachers, we've differentiated work, um, often by input up until now. So that whole idea of, I'll give this group here, this set of work and this group over here, this set of work and so on. And I think now what we're seeing is, the capacity and ability to see, you know, we can actually differentiate, for example, by output. So give one task, a rich task, that has the opportunity and access for every learner to get in, involved in that. And then the exit points are different for different ability levels, different emotional engagement levels, and so on and so forth. So I think there's a real um, excitement to, to change things around. I think there's a real opportunity to think about how do we, how do we acknowledge success in learning? How do we yes. celebrate that? And how do we then build on that? Because, you know, that's one of the things I, I watch my, my kindergarten daughter, who is, is quite a motivated learner. And I watch her experience success. And then the positive reinforcement of well done, darling, from mum or dad just lights her face up. And I think that's a really important thing. How do we do that as we move back in? How do we help to keep parents still in the middle of that, celebrating their kids' success? Because they don't want to be, right? Yes. Having experienced it for the last little while. And I think, you know, on top of all of that, we've got to then think, how do we build on those successes? How do we keep learning relevant, real, and engaging? One of the things that I think we'll see, we've seen in, in COVID is that there's been a chance for, for um, students to kind of engage with some of their passions in their learning. So that whole idea of looking at what, what you might refer to as personal interest projects or kind of things that motivate them. How do we, how do we create a space for that? Yes. In school setting? What does that look like? And these are all ideas. These are not things that we necessarily have to do, but they're things that we have to, we have to give consideration to. How do we keep students in their sweet spot of learning, the, the fancy phrases, zone of proximal development? How do we keep them in that sweet spot so that they're engaged, motivated, and want to learn more? So I think there's lots for us to think about. And yeah. I think we need to do that against the backdrop of learning to learn. And what are your thoughts on students' ability um, to adapt quickly to learning independently, given that they have been home, um, as, you, as you mentioned before, behind that screen? What's your thoughts on that at all? Look, look I, I think one of the things that we probably knew going into this journey at the start was that students and young people are more adaptable than adults. They adjust, they adapt, they become you know, much more flexible than we are as adults. We get stuck in our ways, we want routine, we want students kind of go with the flow. As much as that, as much as um, routine brings them safety, as much as routine brings them um, reinforcement, they also can adapt quite quickly. So we, we know that. And I think we have we've shown that through this journey that they are able to adapt quickly to independent learning um, and, and that they need to do that. You know, to your point earlier about those starts and the jobs that they'll go on to do and the careers that they'll have, the stark reality is that they need to be adaptable. They need to be able to adjust. Um, how do you learn and so on and I think as teachers 
we will reflect on that adaptability. We will think about what does it mean to harness independent learning. Well, there's some really good pedagogical education models out there that really help us to harness the learning independently stream mm. that we talk about there. That whole idea of, of how we create spaces to give each person a role in group work, for example. Whether we talk about looking at how we might harness the power of flipped learning or blended learning or dialogical teaching, there's a whole host of things that we can now go, right, I'm going to pick and choose. And, and for me, one of the things that, that I often come to the conclusion of in education is that there's not one answer, right? There's yes. not one thing that's going to fix it. Because if there were, we would have found it by now. And we would, we would be applying it everywhere. And so what we need to do is we need to be giving our teachers the richest toolbox that we can give them and the, the richest ability to pick the right tool out of that toolbox in order to teach. So how do we give teachers a really broad toolbox in order to teach from? And the same is true of our learners. How do we give them a really broad toolbox from which to learn from? And I think... Um, Learning independently is one of them. Being able to teach others is another. Being able to reflect on my learning is another. Being able to improve, you know, redraft, all of those things are really important. So I think that we have seen students able to adapt quickly to learn independently. However, at the same point, I think we have shown the importance of teachers. I look at my, my middle son, year four, um, a relatively capable kid, but he hates writing. He's a boy. He's a tiny little boy. He hates writing. <laughs> and I can promise you that it's been close to World War Three in this house <laughs> every time he's a writing task at home. And that question of, well, why would you, you wouldn't behave like this at school. Why do you behave like this at home? And we all know the answer. I'm your parent. I'm not your teacher. But but we also know that the different, my, my point there is that there's different scenarios that work depending on where they're at. So I think helping, encouraging our teachers, looking after our teachers, you know, one of the things that I I say every time you give, give me the platform to say is that I think, and we know it from research, John Hattie's research out of Melbourne tells us that the biggest impact on student outcomes is collective teacher efficacy. Teachers, teachers are the things that can make a difference. And their teachers have done everything they can in this journey and they've learned lots and we need to help them, support them, whether that be um, as parents or as, as systems, to help them to harness what they've learned and put it into practice. And teachers, I, I, can't, I can't compliment them enough in this journey. Mm. And how have the recent school changes altered the engagement um, and motivation with children? What are your thoughts on that? Look, look I think one of the challenges that, that, that we all acknowledge, and I just alluded to it there with my own kids, is that it's probably at points been hard to motivate. It's probably been at points hard to engage students in their learning as a parent and probably as a teacher because we're in this uncharted territory um, and, and let's not forget as well and not only are we in an uncharted territory in terms of their sitting at home learning but the instability of of the world will have an impact on young people what does what does this virus mean for me as a seven-year-old kid or a 12-year-old kid what does it mean that mum and dad are at home or mum's at home all the time or mum's lost her job or mum's on furlough or all these things so we've got this this impact on on their life, not just on their learning, but on their life. And so we have, without a doubt, and, and I say this as a parent, seen um, engagement decrease at points in the learning journey and motivation similarly. And I think teachers would acknowledge that as well. However, I think there are some things that we, we ought to remember. Number one, um, we can and will get back to school at some point in the future, we've already seen that here in Australia. But, but I think as well, we have to think about what are we learning? We've got parents who are more engaged than probably ever before in this generation. Parents who are interested in what they can do to really support parents. And I think what most parents have always been that way, but I think this journey has given them an insight into what it actually means to do that and how to do it. So I think um, it's all about how do we how do we understand the parent role and the, the teacher role as we go through. How do we help? How do parents help with that motivation? Versus how do we um, how do we help teachers or, or encourage our parents to support teachers in engagement? It's it's going around harnessing autonomy, which we've really done in this time. But then thinking about that purpose that I spoke about, you know, answering the why of learning that helps. And and I think that the parents more than ever are more equipped to sit around the dinner table of an evening and ask pertinent questions about the learning that's happened. You know, I, I know as, as a kid, I remember my parents would ask me, 
how was school today? And my answer would be fine. And that would be it. Yeah. All of a sudden in the last eight weeks, teach, uh, parents have all of a sudden gone, oh, I know what questions I can ask. And so I think all of a sudden we can really start to think about how we strengthen that partnership, how we engage students in learning that's relevant to them, how we create some motivation in that journey. And I think in many ways, the motivation will be getting back to school, getting engaged with their peers, being part of the, the school system again. And that engagement will slowly come back as teachers um, assess where they're at and, and, and begin to put in place plans and structures for moving forward. So we're uh, aware of the challenges homeschooling has had on many households. And I guess when students do go back to school, as you were just mentioning before, do you actually see that ed tech platforms um, that work closely with the national curriculum could potentially assist with bringing um, students, um, I guess, up to speed uh, and to ensure that they don't get left behind? What are your thoughts on that? I think my first thought there is that a whole host of parents that I've spoken to and, and come across in this journey, that's their number one worry. Will my student be left behind? Um, are they going to fall behind? Is this going to impact them forever? Uh, and, and particularly parents of students in kindergarten and in year 12 are really feeling that. I think that is not necessarily the thing that is front and foremost in teachers' minds. I don't think teachers are overly worried about that left behind idea. Let's remember that everyone has been in the, the same boat. Think, yes. to use a, the phrase in this journey they've all been in the same boat so I think the first thing I would say is is firstly don't panic trust teachers teachers are a great resource and one of the things that teachers are going to do as soon as they get students back is they're going to begin to um, understand where the gaps are and what the gaps are that need to be filled and I think they will harness products like Mathletics like Ready Writer like Reading Eggs where they can um, for example, assign work that should have been learned and the product will then identify gaps and fill gaps in an engaging way and give teachers information about where the gaps are and so on. You know, the, the, the technology that we have in, in Mathletics is adaptive, so it will help to identify gaps and keep students in their zone of proximal development, to use the buzzword. So I think there's a real power in partnership. The EdTech in partnership with, with teachers really helps to, to, to tap into those gaps and to really harness those those gaps and, and make them better. So I think teachers really already from the beginning of this have been thinking about what will I do when I get my students back to back in class? Mm. What are the things that I will do? And I think in many ways we've personalised the learning in this time because the, the students have been able to, they're, they're working personally, so therefore there's lots of it that's been personalised. And so lots of these gaps potentially have already been filled using some products. But I think as we go back, teachers will be able to, to assess and get a good firm grip on, on what gaps are collected with individuals versus whole groups or whole classes and begin to use products and, and services to really help to do that. I think the other thing that EdTech can really do in this time is really help to continue to um, support the strong relationship between home and school. Yes. The, the communication, the information that goes on and really start to do that. And I think, you know, one of the conversations that, that I've been having, we've been having is the whole idea of the social aspects of learning that have been missing. How do they fit in and what do they look like? And there's, you know, there's absolute connection in, in our products that will help to connect the social learning as it has been during this time and as it can do when you go back into the classrooms. So I think for me, yeah, I, I can completely appreciate the concern that parents have. I have it as a parent myself, but I think when I put my educator hat on, I know that teachers have been preparing for this return from the day that schools were closed. And that fills me with confidence and should fill parents with confidence mm. too. <laughs> well, I guess in closing, you know, ed tech really does provide all children um, everywhere with the opportunity, irrespective of, I guess, their geographic location, socioeconomic, you know, disadvantage, maybe even students with special or diverse educational needs or people with disabilities and or people who maybe can't even access quality substitutes for school-based learning environments or mm. quality learning. So ed tech can supply them all with the opportunity to learn. Um, and this really is the right, uh, I guess, to all children uh, to have quality education. So in closing, what are your thoughts on, on this? Okay, I agree. I think that, as I said earlier, education has the key, is the key to breaking a whole of those cycles that you refer to the poverty cycle the, the deprivation the um, accessibility and so on and so i think that that um, edtech really does provide an opportunity for students to access learning to engage with learning to connect with learning and to really um, 
chart the development progress and chart the learning opportunity. And that doesn't mean that I don't see a role for teachers. I think teachers are fundamentally important and I'm sure that's come out through our conversation today. But I think there is a real opportunity for EdTech to really make a difference in, in young people's lives individually, in community lives collectively, and, and in our society and, and broader. They're gonna go on and use technology in their careers and in their lives. And it has the power now to have a real impact in, in them in their time now. So <clears throat> for me, it's a really exciting time. I think I'm really excited about um, where EdTech's going, you know, where we at 3P are going. I think we've got some really exciting innovations ahead. And I think it will make a real difference to learning and teaching both in classes and at home in the months and years ahead. Alan, we've been so grateful for your time. As we said, we know how busy you are. If families want to um, research and end or, um, I guess, sort of um, have their children look further into some of the, um, the, the, the educational platforms that 3P Learning has, where about should they go? Go straight to our 3P website, so 3plearning.com. And from there, you'll be able to see all the products that we offer and, and sign up to a free trial and um, have a look at what we do, what we're trying to do. We're also on Facebook, on Twitter, um, connect with us there, find out what we're doing and, and really um, understand how we're trying to support the development of our young people for richer learning tomorrow. Thank you for your insights and for your time and, and really hope for the opportunity to have a chat with you again in the future. Take care. My, my pleasure, Richard. I look forward to it. Thank okay, you. Bye.